Hello, my pleasure seekers, and welcome to today's show. I have beautiful Justin Patrick Pierce on with me today, and I'm super, super excited to have him as I know he's just released a beautiful book that I know will really help you guys, particularly maybe the male guys of this show, to understand a little bit more about themselves. And yeah, over to you, my darling. Thank you for joining me today. And it would be amazing just to hear a little bit about who you are, and then we can kind of take it from there. Thank you, Lucy. Pleasure to be here with you. Oh, thank you for joining me. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my name is Justin Patrick Pierce. I'm an intimacy teacher. My wife and I, London Angel Winters, we have two books. Uh, our first book was The Awakened Woman's Guide to Everlasting Love. And that was specifically targeted towards women <clears throat> who are interested in attracting the right partner and also creating a sacred relationship, like a relationship you can authentically uh, really know what it is to approach relationship as a spiritual path, we say, where you're growing sexually and spiritually alongside your lover. And then just about two months ago, we released our second book, and that book is called Playing with Fire, uh, The Spiritual Path of Intimate Relationship. And in that book, it's really for men, women, singles, and couples as well. And that's where we go way more into the advanced teachings of uh, sacred sexuality, what this spiritual path actually is and how you can um, deepen your practice with your partner. So whether you're wanting to develop skills on your own or do it inside of a relationship, that book is basically a hand guide that walks you through the experience of what it's like to live this life and what you would need to do to implement the practices. Okay, amazing. Okay, I have so many questions already. I just want to ask you. Um, so how did you get into this space? You mentioned obviously your partner London, like what was the beginning point for you to enter into this place of seeing a relationship in a totally different way of life? I would say it really began in my spirituality. When I was very young, um, I started meditating a lot. And it was something my grandfather had taught me when I was around the ages of five and six years old. It was my first introduction. He passed away shortly after that. So I never really had an in-depth understanding of what I was doing. <clears throat> but by the time I was 11 years old, I moved into the basement of my house. And I just started meditating on my own. And I was really curious what was possible when I closed my eyes and went internal. And I would spend hours in meditation. During that period of time, um, I had a lot of pretty exciting experiences. Um, but those experiences I had, I always felt like your spirituality was something you'd never be able to share with anybody else. The experiences felt real to me, but I didn't think they were anything you could really experience with another, so to speak. I always felt spirituality was kind of a solo journey. <clears throat> Fast forward to my early 20s. My spirituality was never anything I shared with anybody else. I always kept it secret. And then I met London. And <clears throat> London's my wife now. We have a daughter who's four and a half years old. We've been together now for about 12 years. And when I met London, something just clicked. And I felt this spiritual connection with her. And she was actually a practitioner of sexual uh, yoga. She was a sacred sexuality practitioner, which I didn't know when I first met her. But because of that, there was something different about her than any other woman I'd ever met. And I found that particularly uh, captivating. It just drew me in. Mm -hmm. And one day she invited me to a workshop, <clears throat> uh, intimacy workshop. And I thought, man, uh, that sounds like a terrible idea. It's never anything I ever wanted to do. Nothing I wanted to be a part of. I was like an intimacy workshop. This sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, look, I'll give it a shot. I'll go. Yeah. And I went and I was fortunate enough to have my first experience be with some great facilitators, great, ex uh, great teachers. And what happened in that initial workshop was profound for me because as I was going through the practices, what I finally experienced was I got back to that very deep spiritual place I would find in my solo practices and meditations. But suddenly I was experiencing it with another human being. 
where this kind of ecstasy, this freedom, this profound depth that I think we chase in all forms of different experiences, whether it's psychedelics, substances, um, or just life experiences, the pursuit of purpose. <clears throat> we try and chase this feeling. And what was profound for me is just being there with my partner and feeling that free, feeling that depth of connection, feeling that ecstasy available and sharing that experience with my partner. And that moment, everything changed. The facilitators noticed I had a knack for it, so they kept inviting me back and London and I became uh, teaching assistants. And then soon we were teachers in our own right. So that was about <clears throat> 10 years ago now. Yeah. that all of that happened and I've been on this path ever since. And you mentioned, obviously, that to start off with, you were resistant towards it. You thought it was an awful idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how did you actually manage to move from the state of being in that position to actually being relaxed and feeling similar to yourself on your own in your meditation? Because I think for a lot of people, that's the part where nothing can take <clears throat> where the, the resistance or the ego, or whatever you want to call it, can arise. Yeah. You know, I think everyone has their own process when they get interested or involved in this work. And I recognize that some people might approach this work because they feel like there's something lacking about them. They mm -hmm. might have insecurities, they feel like something's broken and they need to find a way to fix it. And a lot of people do come to this work from that place and that's okay if that's where you are and you're looking for kind of an antidote or a medicine to heal sexual trauma or heal, um, your relationship to your sexuality, it's a powerful medicine for that. <clears throat> My attitude was, I don't need any, I don't need any advice around intimacy and sex. I'm good. I know how to do this. I know how to date. I know how to have sex. Like there's a lot of ego in it for me. And there's also a lot of guys who fall into that trap where you think you're, uh, you think your shit don't stink. You think you know what you're doing. You think you're a good lover. You, you know, you have an ego about it and you don't think there's something someone could offer you there or you're just not willing to uh, uh, be that vulnerable to humble yourself and, and let someone show you something. Mm -hmm. So I would say initially my ego was in the way. And... <clears throat> What was profound for me was first recognizing that just dating in a conventional sense or just watching pornos or just being very sexually active and in the conversation around dating, mm -hmm. it's not really the education we think. We're not really becoming experts in love and intimacy. We might become more attractive. We might know how to pick up men or women at the bar. We might know how to be great and look like the most <clears throat> wonderful partner anyone could have but when we actually get into a relationship everything falls apart yeah. because we don't actually know how to love we don't actually understand what it takes to sustain that intimacy we know how to like create it for a moment but then it's short-lived everything spirals into drama and falls apart that's not the life I wanted for myself and sometimes it takes a man waking up next to a stranger in bed so many times to realize that just having more partners leaves you feeling emptier than you were before. Mm -hmm. It's not actually what you deeply want. And I'm not saying this is everyone, but this was me. Was I never had a problem dating, but I did feel empty. And I felt that more women and more dating wasn't the solution. I wanted depth in my life. I wanted a connection that mattered. I want a relationship where trust was present. And now I am so grateful for having this path because I have a woman who I trust implicitly. I have a woman who I know is the best mother for my child on this planet. And that's something I wish every person could have in their lives. Where when you go into the dating pool or when you pursue your sex uh, and in your relationship, that you're going in there with that mindset of what is actually the best medicine for you and your children and your future. Choose a partner and create a relationship that has that intimacy and that spark, but it also has that depth of trust and that depth of trust and that depth of love that endures for many, many years. Mm -hmm. 
this is what this world started to open up to me that wasn't available in my egotistical confidence around having my sexual self all together and knowing what I was doing. It didn't serve me. It was a destructive pattern. So that's why in our new book, Playing With Fire, we go into depth around what it takes to create that polarity, that spark of attraction, that heat that makes you want to embrace, want to fuck. That is so precious. How do you keep that in your relationship for 10, 20, 30 years? And at the same time, develop a deepening in trust and love as you grow together. Mm -hmm. That's a paradox we talk about in Playing With Fire that most couples struggle with because a lot of people have the experience of the polarities there initially. Sex is great, all the heat's there. But in order for us to continue, the fire got it has to go out mm-hmm. and we'll just kind of be more amicable as partners. We'll get along as parents. We'll be great teammates. You know, we'll be roommates. We'll be friends. Mm-hmm. But the passion is absent. And they'll, per- they'll pursue that path because it's functional. It makes things easy when no one's desiring. You know what I mean? And we can just get along as roommates or friends. The opposite some people choose is, well, I want an exciting, passionate life. I want that fire. So let me, let me chase that fire. So they'll go to this partner and the moment the fire burns out, they'll go, oh, I guess I need a new partner. Yeah. Let me get the next partner. Fire burns out. Let me get the next partner. So they try and keep the fire alive by just cycling through partner after partner. What London and I teach in our work and we teach our students is you can have both. Mm-hmm. You can sustain that hot attraction where your desires are ever present in your intimacy. And you could have the longevity of love and trust. You can have a functionally thriving intimacy as you pursue, as you preserve the desire to be intimate with each other. That's what our entire body of work is about. Oh, it's amazing. And I know we don't want to give too much away about the book because we want everyone to read the book. But um, how did you in London come to obviously create both books? Have you had times where you've slipped into the other way, you know, where you have got into the loveless or lustless times, you know, or has it always been you two have worked out how to build this fire and, and keep it alight? Yeah. Hmm. your relationship our relationship will always go through this ebb and flow state Mm. where there's moments where there's a lot of polarity present and then there's moments where there's not a lot of polarity present i'll give you one example you know when london was pregnant um right after she gave birth and our child was crying you know every two hours for six months Mm. that strain on her body from breastfeeding that you know i mean that process, it's not appropriate to be having sex during that period of time. Like there's a demand on her body. We can still love each other, but to be like sexually, you know, ravenous with each other, it's just not appropriate. We're exhausted. We're beat. So our sexuality went offline for a long period of time there during that period, which is appropriate. Mm -hmm. So every relationship is going to have periods of time like that. We also, in our books, we talk about these periods of times where before we actually had our child, we went through like about six pretty devastating miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of them were pretty late term, you know, like London was pregnant. She had, she was showing, you know, like she was in the process. She was lactating and then losing the child. So, I mean, it was devastating on our relationship and in the grieving and mourning process after that, that too was a period of time where intimacy wasn't necessarily appropriate. It was time to be, to bring the love and trust as opposed to the polarity and the hot desire. Mm -hmm. So we go through all of these phases and these phases are natural in all of our relationships. There are times to bring that heat and there are times to bring equanimity, which is the ability to be with what is, to love each other through what is. And that's what creates a strong relationship is when we can sideline our desires for something else that's more important for a period of time, right? Mm -hmm. So as we describe very uh, honestly in our books is London and I've been through it all. We've been through the worst of it. And that's how we share in our books is like, we don't paint this as some rosy picture. We, we, We know relationship is hard and we're gonna, suffer together so to speak in relationship but there's an artistry to loving through the suffering to sustaining your love through the suffering such that each moment of conflict each moment of challenge 
you and your lover come out stronger than you were before. Mm -hmm. That the trust is stronger, that the love is stronger, and the desire is stronger. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's the key piece that a lot of people miss is how does the sexual desire become stronger after these periods of time? So what we teach is we teach practices that help you and your partner get together and explore your desires and do it in a way that's not just talking about them, but actually embodying them. And that's where the book really goes into those nuanced details of how exactly that's done, where you can feel that fire coming back between your bodies. And that's the crazy thing is no matter what you've been through as a couple, how long you've been together, we work with couples been together for 30, 40 years. Wow. So you lost that spark long ago. If you just do the practices and both of you are willing to show up to the work, you will find that spark again. It will come back online because it's physics. It's like physics. You put a positive and a negative together, boom, the sparks are going to flow, right? The, the electricity is going to flow. That's what's so liberating about this work is that so often our minds get in the way, our moods get in the way, and they put up these walls where we feel like intimacy is not possible. And the truth is, if we're just both willing to show up and we do the practices, love re returns, trust returns, sexual desire returns. It all comes back online. But we need to, one, have the willingness to show up, and two, need to know what to do to show up. And then once we learn the practices, they become wisdom you carry in your body that you will always have in your relationship. I mean, it's, it's a profound path. And for me, that's why I've dedicated my life to this work because it is just so profoundly meaningful when you can have a relationship that feels like that, when you can go out into the world, pursue your purpose, chase your dream, whatever it is, and you return home and your home is a place that feels nourishing to you, that fills your cup, that revitalizes you, that helps you endure and then go back out into the world and continue to pursue your purpose you know against all odds that your home should not be a place that's tearing you down mm. but your home is a place that actually restores you and revitalizes you and empowers you to go out in the world be who you need to be before you die who do you need to be this work is about your relationship becoming that healing vehicle that supports you and becoming the greatest person that you can possibly be in this lifetime. Wow. Thank you for so much for sharing all of that. I mean, for people that are listening right now will be thinking that is exactly what I want. Because I feel a lot of the normality at the moment is people sometimes dread going home after their day, right? They've got mm -hmm. their kids or they've got to speak to the wife or the husband and the chores. Is your work primarily aimed at couples or is it also aimed at singles that want to manifest, attract this sort of relationship as well? And this is probably opening up a whole new world to people listening that probably didn't realize this could exist, right? You know, from seeing behaviors from their parents, not, you know, portraying that kind of life. And it's mainly sort of conditioned for us not even to think this could be something we could have in the long run. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, we work with half singles, half couples is typically like 50-50 as our clients come in, whether we're working privately or in group settings. You can be a single and you can clarify that this is the type of relationship that you want to have, that you want to call into your life. And you begin working on the skills you would need to actually be able to show up to such a relationship. Because what we learn through this body of work is it's what you're doing you know, that attracts that certain partner or repels that certain partner. It's what you're doing. So we are co-creators in our relationship and we have a say of what this looks like. And this work empowers us to recognize ourselves as co-creators because most of the time we feel like helpless in love. Like, you know, he loves me, he loves me not. Or, hey, attraction's there today. It's not here tomorrow. You know, like, oh, I guess I need a new partner. You know, like we feel at the mercy of, you know, the ebb and flows of love. We feel victimized by it. We feel like bystanders in it. And this body of work is about empowering you. You can create the relationship you want. You can become a co-creator. You can't become the sole creator because it takes two to tango. Good point. <laughs> but you can become a co-creator. 
and you can choose what you want your life and relationship to look like. Now, a lot of things we teach our students right from the get-go is first you need to make that commitment in yourself and you need to develop some skills. In our book, Playing with Fire, we every chapter there's a practice you can do as a single that you don't need a partner for. And it will begin conditioning and strengthening these qualities in you that will make you a masterful lover. It'll make you a more skillful lover such that when the right partner appears, you know how to show up in that relationship and draw them in and, and keep them and preserve that relationship, keep it something beautiful. The other thing we always have to remember is that our conventional lives are constantly trying to undermine and sabotage intimacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our couch in front of our television that's connected to millions of channels, for example, it's a very seductive setup. It feels more interesting to us than sitting with our partner on the floor with nice cushions and just being present with each other and just exploring each other's bodies. Mm. Like who does that? How strange <laughs> would some, like it's to our culture, it's very odd that we would carve out time in our day for intimacy. Most people just kind of have sex spontaneously in their bed after a long day. That's almost what happens. Like, okay, we're in our bed, about to go to sleep. Okay, let's make love and just pass out. <clears throat> what London and I do and have done for many years because of this practice is we have a specific place in our home where we practice intimacy. It's not in our bedroom. We just sleep in our bed. We don't do intimacy there. That's just for sleeping. We have a space in our room where it's, you know, we have a nice carpet on the ground. It's beautifully set up. There's cushions. It's comfortable. It's a place you want to be. Like you want to like lay on the floor and it's like, mm, it feels good here. Mm -hmm. You create a space in your home that's inviting for intimacy, a place you want to be. And maybe you like wine. So you bring a bottle of wine and you sip wine with there. You might be a tea drinker. So you drink tea, like whatever you want. I used to be a big hookah. I used to love hookah. So I'd have my hookah there and I'd smoke hookah. It's like, make it a space that just feels delicious for you to be in. And that's the start. But in most of our homes, we don't have that type of thing. We have a sitting room, you know, like we have like different spaces. Mm -hmm. But already that's radical. It's going against our cultures and our traditions to have a space in our house specifically for intimacy. That seems weird. That does. But, but when we do it, it's incredible. It's mind blowing what happens when you actually create a physical space for intimacy. Now, some people might be hearing this and be like, I don't have room you know, for that. And I just wanna you know, suggest to everyone here, it's like when I first moved in with London, our space, was about 900 square feet. Um, it was so small. We had a living room, a kitchen where you couldn't fit a kitchen table. You could only fit a cafe table. Oh. And in our bedroom, you couldn't fit a dresser. It only fit a bed. Whoa. <laughs> That's how small the space was. And in our living room, we got rid of the couch and we just created this like ritualized space that felt good on our nervous systems that we wanted to hang out in. So if you live in a really small place, you can still live this life and pursue these practices if you want to. And we committed to that early on. Um, and we love that period of time in our lives. So you could transform any space into a space that feels good in your body, that makes you want to relax, that makes you and your partner feel comfortable to take off your clothes and be intimate with each other. And when you create that space um, for yourselves, you are intentionally creating room for intimacy to be in your lives. So that's something we need to wrap our minds around. And again, in the book, Playing With Fire, we teach you exactly how to do that. And then once you have that space, what you would do in that space to begin developing these skills and intimacy. But it's like, for all the people who are single right now, if I was calling a relationship into my life, I would have a space like that i'd invite them over i'd say come join me sit down here let me pour you tea and serve tea and just drink tea and just be present practice intimacy and being present with each other just on the first date can that person meet you in depth is that person available to be that present with you you know like you're inviting them into a place of depth 
or are they just going to be scrolling on their phone the whole time and totally ignoring everything you're doing and saying and you're like okay you know maybe you're not ready for that kind of relationship right but it's a constant invitation into presence and depth that we must make with each other if we want intimacy to be part of our lives and do you find that when you're working with couples that say like you said have been together for 30, 40 years. Now I'm just thinking about all these amazing tips that you're giving. And I'm thinking some people are so set in their ways. You know, how do you introduce that into them? Because I can imagine that might be harder sometimes, you know, more challenging sometimes versus a single couple that are kind of just getting to know each other, a bit more open-minded, a bit more curious, Mm -hmm. sad. And then say you've got like 67 year old mature couple how do you educate them and make them feel like that is okay? Because that must be so intimidating. Got a lot of respect for people that, and you know, invite that in at that time of their lives. There's no doubt. There's no doubt about it. Um, it is easier to start this work when you're single and to begin a new relationship with these practices, part of the relationship because you create healthy patterns of relating and healthy patterns in your sexuality that then you can build on and you can keep alive. As you said, if you've been together for 20, 30 years, creating a lot of bad habits, Mm -hmm. a lot of patterns of closure, a lot of patterns of sexual rejection, sexual suppression. Yeah, you've got now a history of 20 years, 30 years that you need to begin unwinding. And that's part of the healing process. And we got to do the work. Um, And the older those patterns are, the stronger they are in that system, the more hardwired they are, the more difficult it is. There's no doubt, but it doesn't make it impossible. And a lot of people who come to us who are at that 20, 30, 40 year mark have woken up to the fact that whatever they were doing ain't working. (laughs) whatever whatever they've been doing ain't it Mm. and therefore they're really ready to learn something new because they can they've suffered enough they've 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 suffered enough to realize okay that whatever we've been doing clearly is not the thing let's be open about this let's try it and what's really powerful is once you get them in the practices and once we guide them through the practices and they start to make a little bit of progress, like if, if the patterns are old and they've been together a long time, it could take a few rounds of being guided through practice before they start to feel anything different because they become so numb, so guarded. But they go through the practice and then suddenly something breaks open mm-hmm. and there's this wellspring of emotion. And maybe it's sadness, maybe it's grief, who knows what it is, but there's this wellspring of emotion and suddenly both partners can feel each other again. And that's the most important thing. The moment that happens, it's like when they see the light at the end of the tunnel. The moment they can feel each other again and go, holy fuck, I could feel my partner. I love this person. Look at their heart. And The moment that happens, that's when couples become enrolled and they become empowered to start practicing on their own. And you know, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to go through. It's like any training, whether you're practicing yoga, you're trying to become stronger in the gym by lifting weights, or you want to become a great dancer or a great fighter. You have to train. You have to put your body mind through those practices. This body of work is exactly like that. This is a sexual yoga. You have to show up, you have to breathe, you have to use your body, you have to run these energies through your nervous system if you want to get better at it. You can't merely think about the ideas. You have to put them in your body and practice them with your partner. And the thing about sexual yoga that's pretty challenging is when you sit in front of your intimate partner, that tends to be, while they may be the person you love the most, They tend to also be the person that triggers you the most. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) What else? (laughs) So when you show up, like you are confronting a lot of your own shit. Like you, you just, your reactivity, your traumas are all right there. And that's why it's so healing to practice with the person you love. Because the moment you break that spell, the moment you break that pattern, 
a new love becomes available to you time and time again. And that's the thing. It's like when we're in an intimate relationship, my partner and I, we still hurt each other all the time, not intentionally. Yeah. It's part of intimate relationship. You're unconscious. You say something, you don't keep your word. You lose trust. You know, you, you become reactive and you say something you don't mean. It's all fodder for the intimate relationship. It's to be expected. But the testament of a real couple and their ability to love each other is their ability to come together again after those moments, in the midst of those moments, to heal through those moments, to love each other, to apologize to each other. Man, so many men and women come to me who never learned how to say, I'm sorry. Wow. And if, if we just learned to start by knowing when it's time to just say, hey, I'm sorry, I hurt you. That, that goes a long way. That goes a long way. And it's still shocking to me how many grown adults and people who are in relationships with someone they love mm. still struggle to just say, hey, I'm sorry, I hurt you. That's medicine. That's, that's spiritual maturity. That's not every, there's more to it. But if you find yourself being one of those individuals who can't say, I'm sorry, lean into that edge of being, being capable of when, when you've hurt your partner, I've done something unconscious or reactive, that you're able to come to them in the next moment and say, hey, I'm sorry, I hurt you. Goes a long, long way in one's spiritual maturity. Wow. And I can imagine maybe sometimes in those situations, the other person may not know how to receive it as well, you know, because they've had that communicated before. Oh. Yeah. And so do you <clears throat> find in some circumstances where say they, they've seen this other side of intimacy and love with each other, but it's maintaining that, you know, I think we all look at the, the magic time or the magic moment, but actually in my opinion, it's like, retaining that maintaining and keeping it going okay. what do you advise your couples or singles to actually keep it going because that's the challenge right like yeah. you know you can this can be forever if we keep going <laughs> absolutely yeah. and an intimacy between two human beings it can be intimate infinite Meaning you could never run out of things that you desire sexually or that you desire to feel from your partner, spiritually, lovingly, uh, physically, however you want to experience the moment. You can keep those desires burning hot forever. And that's what we want to do. That's in playing with fire, we talk about becoming a fire keeper. And that's what we mean is we, we keep that fire of desire burning brightly in our bodies. We don't divorce ourselves from our desires. Here's the situation most people find, them in, find themselves in. It's like they feel the desire for their partner initially, but then they feel that desire start to wane. And then when they feel that desire wane, they don't know how to express their desires. So they keep their desires silent. They hide their desires. And then they start fantasizing about situations with other people or, you know, turn that uh, attention towards porn or other places. So they first suppress and hide their desires. And then their desires leak out in sneaky ways. And they ultimately destroy the relationship. They burn the relationship down. We've all been burned in relationship, right? Mm -hmm. because we understand intimacy is a fire that has the power to burn us. So one of the things that happens first in couples is they feel the desire magically present and then they feel the desire wane and they don't know how to bring the flames back. Mm, yeah. and, what, and what they do is when that fire starts to burn in them, they do one of two things. They either reactively project it on their partner like it's their partner's fault so they'll say things to the partner that's hurtful or project on the partner like it's your fault that this desire is gone. You figure this out. That's very damaging. And then the other is, ah, my partner can't meet me there. Let me take my fire somewhere else. And I'll, I'll put my fire somewhere else. Both of those reactions to that fire creates damage and both partners end up getting burned eventually. Right? Yeah. So what we need to learn how to do is how do you feel that desire for what you want, but bring it to your partner in a way that actually invites them and inspires them mm. 
to meet you in their sexuality, to meet you intimately, to meet you in a way that's profound because it's obviously there. That's why you came together as lovers in the first place. Mm -hmm. But it's learning how to feel your desire and bring it to your partner in a way that actually makes them feel loved, that actually inspires them to come closer, to touch, to become what you feel in them, you know, like what you desire most. And that's the gift because for you and anyone else's intimate partner, you want your intimate partner to be great. Do you not? Of course. Otherwise, you, there's no point. There's no point. You, you are your lover's greatest champion. Mm -hmm. You are their oracle. You are the one that sees them better than anyone else. And you see them in their greatness. Mm -hmm. And as a sacred lover, it's our job to make sure that I'm going to evoke in you your greatness. I'm going to draw it out and I'm going to make love to that part of you. And I want that part of you to make love to me. Mm -hmm. These practices teach you exactly how to do that, but we can't do that if we are getting resentful and blaming our partner for the absence of desire or taking our desire elsewhere. The only way we could do it is we let that fire of desire cook inside of us and we learn how to express it in a way that inspires our lover and deepens the love making we're there to share. Oh, it's just so beautiful the way you describe it as well. You know, it's just such a beautiful way of being and experiencing. And you've shared a little bit around your opinion potentially on porn and looking elsewhere. What is your view on polyamory? Because I know that's a big thing that people talk about at the moment. And what do you think that is and how? that facilitates or potentially goes against a relationship or a partnership? Mm. Everyone's different. Of course, yeah. Um, so I want to, you know, I'm not for or against polyamory. Mm -hmm. um, but I am very aware of the pros and cons mm. and the impact that it has on people. And from what I know about all of my years of study and practice and working with countless couples and around this is that the way you have depth in love, depth and in intimacy, is there has to be a profound level of trust. 100%. There has to be a profound level of trust. Otherwise, you're just not going to open all the way. Yeah. You'll open a little bit, but you won't open to the point of spiritual surrender absolute sexual surrender of giving yourself completely and totally if you can't trust absolutely mm -hmm. and what most partners need in order to experience that level of trust is commitment mm -hmm. is to, to is to be the one and if they're not the one they could still have sex they could still have a good time they could still you know but not most people are not wired to open and surrender themselves sexually, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Unless a part of them knows this is forever. Like you are the one. If that's not there, it's very difficult for the entire body and mind to open an, an ecstatic surrender. So in my body of work, what I'm interested in is that place mm -hmm. where our union between our bodies isn't merely about getting off or having a super orgasm like some people come to this work because they want to figure out how to have multiple orgasms and internal orgasms something i do teach something i do do but mm -hmm. as someone who's cultivated that skill it's not a big deal it's not important it really has nothing to do with this work is here to teach us about like it's just like anything it's like okay so now you can have an internal orgasm you could have a hundred of them so what now what you know, yeah. you're, you're still fighting with your partner. You're still miserable. You know, like, yes. <laughs> like it's so the same thing. <laughs> so what I want to do is I actually want to liberate people. I want them to experience a profound love in their lives where they finally feel like enough, where they, they're not feeling like they're too much or not enough, but they feel like enough. They feel loved. They feel free. They feel liberated. They feel nourished. They feel empowered. They feel like that's the experience. And what I've discovered over the years is 
What creates that is a profound level of commitment between two people, a profound, the, the attitude of I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I'm here with you. I'm not going anywhere. I love you. And the response being, I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you with all of my being. And that's just the foundation. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the foundation of sacred love. If that's not there, we can learn, learn the techniques and like become better at dating or better in the bedroom. But our intimacy will ultimately lack a depth that I think every human being is ultimately yearning for, which is just mm -hmm. to feel like, fuck, you really are appreciated for who you are. You really are enough. Mm -hmm. You really are great. I worship you. I love you. I'm devoted to you. I think every human being wants to know that and feel that, that they are complete, that they are whole, that they are enough. And your intimate relationship can provide that for you. And it should provide it as far as I'm concerned. Cool. The, the only reason it doesn't is because culturally we've completely lost sight of that. We, yeah. we, we, we don't view intimate relationship for those purposes. We, we've become so obsessed with making money and being productive and becoming a star and becoming this and that and the other thing that there's no more intimacy left in our lives. It's like our lover gets the leftovers. You know, at the end of our day of trying to become something or someone, by the time we see our lover, it's like, okay, I'm exhausted now. Mm. <laughs> what do I have left to give you? Mm, not much. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, that's backwards. It should be the other way around. Our intimate relationship should be the thing that feeds us and supports us and gives us the energy and power to then go out into the world and kick ass. <sighs> so good so oh so delicious and then what would you say um for people if they are listening to this and they're like this is exactly where I feel like I'm at what are the ripple effects you notice that they have in the rest of their lives once they've established this either new connection or renewed connection you know how else can they expect to be in their lives as well as in their relationships with the other person and themselves hmm. <laughs> well, there's a few different things I could bring up on this point but but the first thing that comes to mind is pretty funny which is as people come into this work they're like oh my relationship's so fucked up you know da, 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 drama and they go and they do the practices suddenly the relationship feels amazing and everything's going well and then they'll show up to the next session and be like ah well I don't need to talk about my relationship because that's fine. But let me tell you about all the ways my purpose now is fucked up. And yeah. that's all, yeah. you know, that let me create the new drama because we solved this one. So I notice in a lot of human beings, we tend to perpetuate the problem of drama in either love or purpose. That either love and intimacy, like the relationship's the problem and that's what's killing me or purpose is the problem or both, right? Mm -hmm. And then the moment we solve one problem, then all of our attention just deviates to the other one. Okay, now the problem is money, you know, or the problems my, my work. So what we need to be careful about it is recognizing in ourselves that our minds are problem making and problem solving machines. Mm -hmm. There's always a problem to solve because we're, we're, we're trying to fix something. We're always looking for something to fix. So whether it's in love or whether it's in purpose, the mind is constantly trying to constantly trying to change what is constantly trying to create a different effect because what this practice is here to teach us is that inside of ourselves we we don't feel like we're enough we don't mm -hmm. feel complete we don't feel like we have enough we feel like we're fighting for survival we don't feel sustained supported mm -hmm. So inside of ourselves, there's like something I have to do. And that feels like a problem to solve. And we either project that in our pursuit of purpose or we project it in love on our relationship. So as you ask this question, it's like, that's the first thing that comes to mind because it's like, as we really start to heal through this practice, what becomes most obvious to us And this is going to sound strange to a lot of people, I think, but there's no problem to solve. That 
once you can actually feel yourself as consciousness, as love, that there's nothing you need to do to be worthy. This is nothing you need to do to prove that you can actually just be and your essence is totally free, totally complete. That's mm -hmm. what this practice is here to take us to. And we might have moments of that, like if you take a psychedelic, you like get to that place, you feel it for a moment, or you have a great orgasm and you feel it for a moment, or you achieve something great in your life and you feel it for a moment, but the next moment it's gone. It's, you lose it and you suddenly don't feel free. You don't feel like you're loved. You don't feel special. You don't feel significant. Like you, you lose it. It comes like boop, boop. <laughs> Yeah. This, this practice is about waking up inside of you, the part of you that knows who you are at your real depth, mm -hmm. that nothing about you needs to change for you to be worthy of love, that you are free now as consciousness. That part of you wakes up and that's the teaching. And then whatever you do in your purpose or whatever you do in your relationship, it's all just play. It's just, what do you want to create today? You know, like shoot for the moon, get whatever you want, you know, desire big, awesome. Mm -hmm. But don't per pursue desire because you think you're broken, because you think you're not enough. Start by recognizing that you are enough mm -hmm. and live from that place as love. And then your relationship will be beautiful as opposed to frustrated. And the pursuit of your purpose will be brilliant and exciting and fun as opposed to a grind that just drains you. And no matter how much money you make, you just have that feeling like it's never enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a prison. It and is. I'll, I'll say just for the people who pursue purpose in that way, like a lot of men who might be listening to this call, it's like, um, and, and women. But when you pursue purpose with the idea, like, I'm going to create this purpose and it's going to set me free. Like once I create this thing, I'll be financially free. I'll be able to travel wherever I want. I have more free time. I'll be able to do this. Let me create this machine that will take me to freedom. And I work with a lot of very successful human beings, very, very successful, who've done there. They've been there. They've done that. And they're amassed in what the world would call success. But nevertheless, where do they feel 20 years down the road? They feel imprisoned. Mm -hmm. by the vehicle they created to become free this this vehicle they created to take them to freedom mm -hmm. they suddenly feel themselves floating out in space now imprisoned in this vehicle and it feels like a prison they can't escape they don't feel freer now, regardless of the money and the ability to take time off and travel they don't feel freer and these practices are about waking us up mm -hmm. that we can't become free if we constantly presume that we are broken and there's a problem to be solved, our ability to be love, to love, to feel love, to be free inside of this moment can only happen here mm -hmm. inside of ourselves, first and foremost. And that's what sacred intimacy is ultimately about, is waking up to that. Oh, beautiful. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing and for just being you and speaking up about what you truly believe in and embody, which I think is so unusual to find in someone. So thank you so much for, for sharing today. And for anyone that's listening that wants to reach out to you, where can they find you? And also where can they get the book books from as well? Yeah, both of our books are on Amazon. Okay. Um, so the first book is the awakened woman's guide to everlasting love that's targeted towards women and you can buy it for your partner um, if you want your partner to have a great introduction to this book i mean to this work women love that book and then our other book is playing with fire the spiritual path of intimate relationship um, and again that goes way in depth around the principles and practices of sacred sexuality it's great for men women and couples to get into that book uh, both are on amazon and the best way to find me is on my website, justinpatrickpierce.com. And on there, I have uh, online classes. We do workshops about four or, five, four or five times a year for men, single men, women, and couples. And you can come and work with us in person. Um, so that's a great way to also dive into the work. That was the first introduction I had into the work. So that's one of those moments where you can have really a breakthrough experience. 
Um, and then we also offer private mentorship for anyone who's more serious about going really deep into the work. Amazing. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes as well. So if anyone's listening, they can find Justin on there. And the one question I always like to ask my guests is, what is a simple pleasure that you have in your life that you love to do on a daily basis, if there is one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sacred sexuality practice mm-hmm. is, is my life's pleasure. It's mm-hmm. what makes me feel, it's what makes my life feel uh, revitalized, deeply meaningful, reconnected. Um, it gives me the energy to just keep on trekking and doing what I need to do in this lifetime. So that practice, when I wake up and I become present with my partner, and we make love through those practices, that is my greatest life's pleasure, no question. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And but yes, anyone that wants to hear more from Justin or reach out to him, I'll put all the information in the show notes. And thank you everyone for listening to today's episode. And thank you so much, Justin, for joining. I really appreciate your time. It's an honor. Thank you, Lucy. Pleasure.